Rural hospitals are community strongholds, serving as the key point of care for nearly 20% of Americans. Beyond providing healing and hope, rural hospitals nationwide are pillars of their local economies, creating essential jobs that support families and community vitality. The emergence of COVID-19 has created unprecedented challenges for the U.S. hospital system. As frontline responders, hospitals have significant responsibilities for identifying and treating patients with COVID-19. Hospitals around the country are adapting to the constantly changing face of the COVID-19 pandemic by adopting both expected and novel strategies to tackle the crisis. Welcome to Advancing Health, a podcast brought to you by the American Hospital Association. I'm Tom Hederly, Executive Speechwriter for AHA. For this podcast, we honor our hospital heroes and focus on a year in the life of King's Daughters Medical Center, Brookhaven, Mississippi, from the perspective of its CEO, Alvin Hoover. Good day. I'm John Sublett, Senior Director of Rural Health Services for the American Hospital Association. It's been a year since we reported on the effect of the COVID-19 pandemic at King's Daughters Medical Center located in Brookhaven and serving Lincoln, Lawrence, and Pike counties in Mississippi. A little background. KDMC is a not-for-profit 79-bed sole community hospital serving a disproportionate number of Medicare and Medicaid patients. It provides a full scope of inpatient acute and emergency services and operates five medical clinics, providing primary and specialty services to the 100,000 people in their service area. With me is Alvin Hoover, CEO of King's Daughters Medical Center. And you may remember Alvin from a podcast we recorded about a year ago. Today, we will look back at a year in the life of Alvin and King's Daughters Medical Center. Alvin, I recall that King's Daughters Medical Center implemented a variety of strategic and operational shifts in anticipation of the surge of COVID-19 patients last March. Tell us a little bit about what those strategies were and what you found helpful or successful. Sure. Uh, thanks for having me, John. Uh, last year, as the COVID pandemic started, uh, really worldwide, we, we assigned a senior leader to look at it and just be prepared, keep up with CDC and things that were happening. So we felt like we were at least a, aware of uh, potential uh, illnesses that were going to happen in our community. Uh, we certainly didn't foresee the, the quantity of, of sick people that we um, were going to be taking care of. Uh, we ended up uh, declaring a state of emergency uh, about midway through our state did midway through March. Um, we closed our physician clinics. We um, had to close our outpatient procedures down at the hospital, including surgery. Uh, that left us with some staff that uh, some we put on furlough and some we were able to redeploy into the hospital, into uh, nurses in the medical and ICU. And then uh, we had a, a few Med, medical assistants and techs that we were able to use on the floor. So uh, that was an, an important part for us is to how do we staff up for the quantity of patients that we were seeing and some of those staff that, um, that we weren't using in outpatient helped us there. We really scrambled it to find PPE. Um, we used up what we had in a hurry. We got down to really four or five days worth of PPE, N95 masks and gowns and um, man, what a challenge it was to put those, uh, our, our folks in harm's way and, and fear that we were not going to be able to protect them. Uh, we, we hustled, we, we looked for everything that we could find. Um, one of the hospitals near us donated 1,600 N95 masks. And so that, that helped us get through the initial surge uh, of, of N95s. And then our gowns were running out. Um, we found a, a local company that makes garbage bags, and we were able to get those guys to help us design a, a plastic gown. They, they, they redeployed their, their staff and 
and made a, a gown. They put arms on the garbage bag. They cut a hole in it. You slip it over your head, and then they perforated the back so you could just rip it off when you were done and um, keep clean. That was that was pretty cool. And then um, uh, from a ventilator perspective, we had five vents to start. Um, and one of those was old. So we refurbed an old bird, um, made it like new. We borrowed a vent from a, a, another neighboring hospital. And then the state finally came through and, and picked up a couple of vents so, to, to help us get enough that we could take care of the critical care patients in our hospital. We stood up in a, a mobile testing site almost um, overnight. Um, as we saw the, the, the need for it, we put it on campus here and, and we were able to give out tests. We, we quickly got up into the uh, 40, 50 tests a day. And, and I think at the, at the height of it, we were doing probably 150 tests a day in our community. So um, there was a tremendous need for testing. Um, our third floor, typically the medical unit, we, we carry about 22 patients up there. We, we turned the whole floor into a COVID unit. And um, uh, anybody that wasn't COVID related, once we found out they weren't COVID, we put them down on the second floor in our surgical unit, which was essentially closed uh, since we weren't doing inpatient surgeries and really no outpatient surgeries for that first couple of months, only emergent surgery. So we kept a few beds available for that. And um, uh, the third floor, you know, especially as we saw we were struggling with a PPE, we said, what else can we do? We were able to convert all of the rooms up there to a negative pressure just by making a few simple changes to some of our fan systems. Um, so that that kind of gives you a, a quick rundown of the main things that we did just getting started with the pandemic. So, Alvin, that is what you experienced back a year ago in March during spring break, but you've had additional surges since then. How have you managed that over the course of the past year? John, we've had uh, two additional surges. We had one that uh, started in um, July and ran through August, and, and it was worse than the first one. We had another one started in October and ran through February, which was the, the biggest, meanest one of all. And each time we saw increasingly more patients, increasingly sicker patients, more ICU, more um, critical care patients, more, uh, it, it really came to a point where we had the system of care in the state that we became the next up ICU. And when our number was called, we had to take that patient. Our ICU volume went up to 13 with 12 of those patients on the vent. Uh, just a tremendous staffing challenge for us. Uh, uh, a, a tremendous emotional challenge for us, and, and it was uh, uh, really the most difficult time that we've seen, complicated with um, high volumes in the ER and, and just not enough providers, not enough staff. Uh, we really considered implementing a scarce resource policy, but um, statewide there was essentially one in place, and we didn't have to call it here at our hospital. So, Alvin, as a sole community hospital, you served a disproportionate number of Medicare and Medicaid patients. What policy changes could help a hospital like yours? Well, I, I want to say that our, our dish depends on the number of patients that we have. And so on the one hand, we've had a, a, a lot of Medicare patients that were sick with COVID. On the other hand, if, if patients weren't sick with COVID, they weren't coming to the hospital. We saw that business just dry up. And I, I think it has something to do with the, the, the crazy sick people that we see a little bit now. But for the most part, if, if you were older, a senior adult, and you didn't have to have your care right now, you didn't get it. And probably that led to people getting sicker later on. Ultimately, it gets back to my volumes have shifted in the in and Medicare and Medicaid. And I wanna make sure that we are able to continue to stay a sole community hospital provider and that we continue to qualify for our supplemental payments and particularly that uh, the 340B money stay in place. So Alvin, you're a 340B hospital and, and clearly that's something that you wanna uh, protect and, and on which you rely, especially as a disproportionate share hospital. 
What new models of care payment would improve access to care for other vulnerable rural communities that are served by critical access hospitals? Well, I think it's important that that hospitals are able to stay in their community. The, the, this pandemic is putting a lot of hospitals under stress. And when the, when the federal money goes away, the, the, the CARES Act money goes away, I think rural hospitals are gonna really struggle to maintain their position. You know, people need a place of care. And so maybe the model needs to change so that you don't have to have inpatient care to be a hospital. Uh, maybe there's a way that that we can keep primary and emergency care in, in communities without having full hospital services there as we know it today. Critical access hospitals certainly been strained by the pandemic and, and you know, it's going to be a different environment for us when we're done. And, and so maybe some of those hospitals aren't going to make it. Maybe some PPE, PP, PPS hospitals aren't going to make it. But if we can have preventive and emergency visits available in communities, maybe not inpatient care, and so we still have most of the basic hospital services there, that would be helpful. You know, somehow we've got to eliminate um, disparities in rural areas. Most of, of our rural hospitals serve uh, predominantly poor and black communities, and uh, we need to make sure that they have access to the care they need and, and that it's not different from anybody else's care. And so that making sure that we have equity in healthcare is going to be important, particularly in rural America. And uh, finally, you know, in, in Mississippi, we need to expand Medicaid. That's that's money that's left on the table. Uh, we've got a proposal here in Mississippi called Mississippi Cares that would really uh, let hospitals generate the money that goes to the federal government. And it comes back as really a boon for our state government. And we're having a difficult time getting that message across. So if those, those of us in community states that don't have expansion, we need to make sure that that happens somehow this year. Alvin, while hospitals like yours continue to manage the surges in the pandemic, you're also uh, managing distribution of the vaccine, which has varied significantly from one state to the next. Can you tell us a little bit about how the vaccine is distributed in Mississippi? That is, what role does King's Daughters play and how has your staff managed their duties to test, treat, and now administer the vaccine to residents in your community? And who are your key partners? Well, the Mississippi Department of Health is responsible for uh, testing and vaccination in Mississippi, and they set up regional sites for all of that. Uh, we put up a... a a request to them that we could do some vaccines. We didn't know how many we could do, but they sent us uh, 200 the first time and 500 the second time and somewhere between 200 and 500 each week uh, since we started. Uh, we set it up, at, basically we started doing it on weekends. So either Friday evenings or Saturdays after regular hospital hours. And we brought people into the hospital, ran them, ran them walked them through uh, uh, a series of of registration and education and then uh, vaccination and then waiting for it. it. It took about 30 minutes for us to do all of that. And we were able to move about 100, 100 people an hour through that. Uh, so in anywhere from three to five hours, depending on how many um, vaccines we had to give, we were able to, to do that. We were able to maximize the vaccines. We, we really picked up uh, an extra dose just about an extra dose per vial, sometimes not quite, but uh, by the end of the day, we typically had uh, six or eight extra doses that we could give to our community because we were maximizing that. We we had our hospital employees volunteer their time initially to, to, to do that. We picked up volunteers from high schools that uh, needed community hours and, and they could push wheelchairs or they could clean clipboards, whatever we could do. We, we really had about 40 people or so that would support that that clinic. Since then, we've moved it into weekdays and do about 100 a day. And, and it doesn't overly tax us and keeps our weekends kind of free. But it's been a, a really great opportunity for our hospital to make an impact between our employees and our community. We've, we've given about 6,000 doses of the vaccine uh, since um, the end of December. Your personal experience. I tell you, John, the um, volunteering for the the vaccine clinic was probably 
the most fun that I've had as a hospital CEO, and particularly after a year of the pandemic. Uh, that first clinic with the 75 year olds that came through, uh, they were so grateful, had such gratitude and such hope. I mean, and they were just fun to take care of. After a year of COVID, to see those guys come in and be hopeful that they were grabbing a little piece of their lives back because the vaccine was available to them was just so rewarding for me. That's really encouraging to hear. I'm sure it was a joyful moment for all, all of K, uh, KDMC. I have to ask you, Alvin, if you've encountered any vaccine hesitancy within your community, and if so, what steps you're taking to build trust in vaccine acceptance? Well, we have we have seen some. Uh, really, it started with our staff. Our, you know, we got off to a great start. We offered it to our physicians. We had about 80% of those guys take the vaccine. And then we offered our employees. And after that first week, we had about 15% of our employees say they wanted to get a vaccine. It's crept up. We're we're sitting at about 40, 40, 45% of our employees that have been vaccinated at this point. But that's so frustrating. They've had a variety of personal reasons, I guess that range from is it safe to uh, I've had the virus already and I'll, I'll let somebody else get the vaccine. Uh, it, it's just a whole variety of things. And we've tried to put education out there about the safety of the vaccine and and that um, and testimonies from people that have had it. Uh, we've not had any real serious reactions. We've had people that had some fever and you know wanted to stay in bed for a day or so. But for the most part, we've had excellent results uh, from our staff and from the community. Uh, it's really important to us. And I'll tell you just one other thing real quick is when we started it, it looked like the only people who were getting the vaccine were white folks. And so after a couple of weeks of that, we said, what do we need to do to reach out and make sure that our black community is, is able to come in and um, get the vaccine? We went to we went and redid our Facebook and our Instagram pages. We talked to black pastors and black churches in town. We got with the clubs and really made a push. And so after that third week, we started seeing the, the demographics change a little bit. And ultimately, you know, by now, it looks like the demographics certainly match our community um, demographics. That's great to know um that you really were able to work with the civic clubs and churches in brookhaven and lincoln county in order to get the vaccine out to the folks who were hesitant or otherwise um it wasn't otherwise available you know alvin there's no debating that the pandemic has been hard and it has underscored the growing instability of rural hospitals but we've also seen the amazing compassion of our caregivers and the commitment and strength of our field to care for those in need and improve health for all. So as we move beyond COVID, what can you tell us you've learned from the experience of the past year? Well, I guess my biggest takeaway, John, is that there's a tremendous resilience in our community and in the communities of, of my colleagues that I, that I talk with uh, to handle crises. And, uh, you know, you, you look back and you say, man, if we hadn't had the provider relief funds, we wouldn't have made it. But you can look back and say, if we hadn't had the spirit of, of the heroes that work here, um, we wouldn't have made it. Uh, just the compassion, the, the willingness to do. Uh, one of my nurses said, uh, you know, Alvin, it's such, a, it's such a neat thing to work here because in the ICU, my colleagues are asking me what they can do to help. Before I ask, before I have to ask for help, you know the emotional stress that we've faced has been overwhelmingly traumatic, and you know in our case we had um, a period of time in this last um, um, surge where we saw more deaths than we've ever seen. Typically we have five or six deaths a month, and in 60 days we had about six, 50 deaths. Uh, the emotional stress, you could just see it on people's face and yet they kept coming back to work. And we've tried to reach out and make sure that we're meeting their needs as much as we can, that they have the right resources, um, behavioral wellness, um, EAP to take care of their needs, but their resilience, their willingness to get back up and come back in and do it all over again is tremendous. I talked to one gal who said, uh, 
I had the best day that I've had in a year. And it wasn't a vaccine day. It was a day that she had a student in working with her. They got to do some procedures. And she said, I went home and I wasn't crying on the way home. Uh, that resilience uh, is, is just a, the core of, of what's helped us through this crisis. Well, and you're saving lives in the face of tra tragedy and um, the special relationships that have been formed across those in the community proved to be the legacy for the pandemic. Tell us, though, what will you take from this experience to improve care for the patients you serve? Well, John, ultimately, people are at the center of what we do, and uh, they're at the center of our mission and vision and the values that we've developed. Uh, they, the, that mission, vision, and values have led us through the crisis, but people are at the center of it. That's what we do. Um, we do save lives. We save lives every day. And that's made us stronger as a hospital and, and an even more important part of our community. Well, what doesn't break us makes us stronger. And I can see that that's the truth for those in Brookhaven, Lincoln County, and King's Daughters Medical Center. Thank you very much, Alvin. The strength of our rural health care is critical to the fabric of American health care. And it's our mission to safeguard it, improve it, expand it, and advance it for future generations. Thank you to our country's healthcare providers for their hard work, dedication, and personal sacrifice in this trying time. And thank you to the hospital and health system leaders like Alvin Hoover, CEO, and the nurses, physicians, and all the healthcare heroes caring for patients at King's Daughters Medical Center in Brookhaven, Mississippi, and across rural America. This is one of several stories of how rural hospitals are rising to the challenge of COVID-19 Visit us at www.aha.org to access these and other COVID-19 resources available to hospitals and health systems. Thank you very much and have a great day.